The most famous proof of the existence of God is probably the ontological argument, which tells us, in one way or another, that since God is a necessary being, it can't be otherwise than that he exists, that somehow there is a conceptual contradiction in the thought that God does not exist. Now, one thing that might have um, struck us when we read section 2 of the ideal is that Kant doesn't really talk about necessary existence. The ideal of pure reason is the highest being, is the being that contains the sum total of all possibility, or maybe the ground of all possibility, but it wasn't said that it was a necessarily existing being. And so the task of section three is really to make this move towards the idea of a necessary being. So here is what Kant does. He starts by saying that it is, in a sense, too obvious that this idea of that this transcendental ideal of the highest being is a mere figment of the imagination. Um, it's too obvious for us to really be misled by that. However, Kant says, there is something else that helps generate the transcendental illusion. And that is the fact that presented with this world of apparently contingent items, right, things that could also have been different, we wonder why they are the case at all. Right? And we posit that there has to be some necessary being that underlies them all. And so at the bottom of 584, Kant tells us, if something, no matter what, exists, then it must also be conceded that something exists necessarily. For the contingent exists only under the condition of something else as its cause. And from this, the same inference holds further all the way to a cause not existing contingently, and therefore necessarily without condition. That is the argument on which reason grounds its progress to the original being. It is only the force of this argument, of the idea that there must be a necessary being, that, according to Kant, leads us into the transcendental illusion of believing that we know that there exists a transcendent God. So, one of the things that Kant uh, points out further in this section 3 is that, yeah, okay, if we, were to, if we, if we had to make a decision like among all the beings that we can conceive of, which of them would be the necessary being, then there is no better choice to make than the highest being of section two. Right? So it makes some sense to identify the necessarily existing being with the highest being of section two and say God necessarily exists. However, Kant says, we don't have to make a decision, right? We're not forced to do that. And when we look at the situation sort of calmly and objectively, we see that we have no theoretical ground to make this identification. So he tells us at A588 that it cannot be inferred that therefore the concept of a limited being, which does not have the highest reality, contradicts absolute necessity. So what Kant is saying there is that when you think about a limited being, let's say this pencil, um, nothing in the concept of this pencil requires you to think it as a necessary being. That doesn't mean that it is not a necessary being, right? There's no way to know that the things around us are not necessary beings. So a little bit later on, Kant tells us, rather, we are still at liberty to count all the remaining limited beings equally as absolutely necessary even though we cannot infer their necessity from the universal concept we have of them. Looked at in this way, however, this argument has not produced for us even the least concept of the properties of a necessary being and has, in fact, not achieved anything at all. Okay, so the argument of the common understanding, which claims that the highest being of section two must be the necessary being, and so God must exist necessarily, that argument has not achieved anything at all. That's, that's the basic story here. Kant will go on to discuss three famous proofs for the existence of God. He first tells us that there are only three kinds of proof. 
and you know anyone who's delved into proofs of the existence of God might be slightly um, surprised by that because there is a seemingly unlimited list of proofs of the existence of God but Kant believes that they all fall into three categories. You could either try to prove God from what we empirically find in the world, right? The fact that maybe the world is so beautifully ordered and harmonious. Or you could try to prove the existence of God from the fact that some things exist. Right? At least one thing exists, but that requires God. That would be the basic idea. Or finally, we can try to prove God, you know, without needing any existence from concepts alone. The latter is the one Kant is going to talk about first. It is the ontological proof. And Kant believes it is the most fundamental because he's going to tell us that the other proofs are in a sense based on or require the ontological proof, which of course means that as proofs, they're not very good. Okay, so let us look at section four and the ontological proof. And we will do the other proofs in the next video. So section four is called On the Impossibility of an Ontological Proof of God's Existence. And it is one of the most famous sections of the critique of pure reason. Kant's criticism of the ontological proof has been very, very influential. And anyone, you know, trying to give us an ontological proof nowadays is going to be well aware of Kant's criticism and sort of trying to work around that. So Kant's first point is that you really can't get into a contradiction by claiming that something doesn't exist. But how do you get into a contradiction? Well, if I say that a triangle has four sides, that is a conceptual contradiction, right? That, that, I can't do that. I can't say that. A triangle has four sides. Why not? Well, when I posit a triangle, I posit three sides. So when I then go on to claim that it has four sides, I'm contradicting myself. So when I posit something, I also posit everything that follows from the concept of what I am positing. Now, Kant says, whenever you say that A doesn't exist, what you're really doing is that you are not positing A, right? Doesn't exist is a very special kind of, kind of linguistic item. It is not at all like a triangle has four sides. By saying doesn't exist, I'm not positing the thing. And if I don't posit the thing, there's nothing that I could possibly contradict. Right? There's, there's nothing there for me to get any contradiction from. So at the bottom of A594, Kant tells us that if I cancel the subject together with the predicate, then no contradiction arises. For there is no longer anything that could be contradicted. To posit a triangle and cancel its three angles is contradictory. But to cancel the triangle together with its three angles is not a contradiction. It is exactly the same with the concept of an absolutely necessary being. If you cancel its existence, then you cancel the thing itself with all its predicates. Where then is the contradiction supposed to come from? Now, Kant knows full well that the uh, rational theologian is going to tell him that God is very different from a triangle that you cannot not posit God in a sense. So at the bottom of A595, Kant writes, Now no escape is left to you except to say, there are subjects that cannot be cancelled at all, and thus have to remain. But that would be the same as saying that there are absolutely necessary subjects, just a presupposition whose correctness I have doubted, and a possibility of which you wanted to show me. In the rest of the section, Kant is going to, I would say, add two major things to this. So the first major thing is that he's going to reanalyze the problem in terms of analytic and synthetic statements. And he asks, well, okay, God exists, right? Is that supposed to be an analytic statement or is it supposed to be a necessary, sta a synthetic statement? If it's an analytic statement, then Kant tells us that A597, um, we end up with nothing but a miserable tautology, right? There is a sense in which if I, if I sort of just define God as existing and view God exists as an analytic statement, which adds nothing to the concept, yeah, I mean, you can do it, maybe, but it's a miserable tautology. Kind of in the same sense that, you know, suppose that I say that an um, exable 
an example is an existing table. And then I say, well, you can't deny the existence of an example because an example doesn't exist is a contradiction. Yes, but an example exists is a miserable tautology, right? It doesn't tell us anything about real existence. Okay, so that's not really useful. Now, on the other hand, Kant says, suppose that it's synthetic, and of course it has to be synthetic. Any claim of existence has to be synthetic. This is A598. If you concede, on the contrary, as in all fairness you must, that every existential proposition is synthetic, then how would you assert that the predicate of existence may not be cancelled without contradiction, since this privilege pertains only in the analytic propositions as resting on its very character? Right? The denial of a synthetic proposition can't be a contradiction because synthetic propositions are precisely not true because of the meaning of the concepts alone. They, don't, they are not governed. Their truth doesn't follow from the principle of non-contradiction. So here with this analytic synthetic distinction, Kant basically claims um, or argues that there is no room for a proof of the existence of God. Right? Because if it proves something analytic, it proves something useless, miserable even. And if it proves something synthetic, it can't be a good proof, because you can't prove something synthetic from concepts alone. Now, the second thing, the second major thing that Kant, uh, Kant adds, maybe the most well-known and, uh, and possibly illuminating part of the section, is his analysis of being or existence or reality, and his claim that this doesn't function as a predicate. At least it doesn't function as a normal predicate. So here is what Kant writes at the bottom of A598. Being is obviously not a real predicate that is a concept of something that could add to the concept of a thing. It is merely the positing of a thing or of a certain determinations in themselves. In the logical use, it is merely the copula of a judgment. The proposition God is omnipotent contains two concepts that have their objects, God and omnipotence. The little word is is not a predicate in it, but only that which posits the predicate in relation to the subject. So what Kant is telling us is that is, or being, or reality, or you know, all those all those things, when I say that something is real or that it exists, I'm not adding anything to the concept. So here is, here's a way to think about that. Suppose we have the concept of a cow. Okay, a cow. Think about a cow. If I say the cow is green, I'm adding something to the concept, right? Green cow. Okay, you know, that adds something to the concept. If I say that the cow exists, I'm not adding something to the concept. In fact, I ought not to be adding something to the concept because it had better be the case that whatever it is that exists, when I say that the cow exists, is precisely what I was thinking under the concept of cow before existing had been added to it. Right? Existing had better not add anything to the concept. Because if it does add something to the concept, then whatever exists can't be what I was thinking in the concept. So at A599, Kant uses the example of a hundred dollars, thalers, I think it is in the original German, he says, hence, when I think this object is given absolutely through the expression it is, nothing is thereby added to the concept, which expresses merely its possibility. Thus, the actual contains nothing more than the merely possible. A hundred actual dollars do not contain the least bit more than a hundred possible ones. Or at the beginning of A600, he says, Thus, when I think a thing through whichever and how many, however many predicates I like, even in its thoroughgoing determination, so I think it like totally, completely, not the least bit gets added to the thing when I posit in addition that this thing is. For otherwise, what would exist would not be the same as what I had thought in my concept, but more than that, and I could not say that the very object of my concept exists. This analysis of the nature of existence claims has been taken up completely, one could say, in modern logic. Right? Modern contemporary logic, 20th, 21st century logic, treats existence very, very differently from any 
like real predicates. Um, it treats it like a quantifier if you uh, have any knowledge of, uh, of formal logic. And so what Kant claims is going wrong is that if you try to define, if you try to tell what the concept of God is, and one of the elements of the concept is existence, right? God is a simple, perfect, existent being, something like that. Or even just God is the necessary being, where necessary means necessarily existing. You are creating a pseudo concept. Right, you are creating a pseudo concept, and that is, for instance, why my example of the exable, like the existing table, that that's a pseudo concept, right? There, you, you can't bring in the concept. It doesn't make sense to talk about exables, right? There's when I when I talk about tables, I talk about tables, right? You can't add something like the table that exists here that I'm sitting at right now is just a table that exists. It's not a special kind of table, the exable, um, which could be opposed to another kind of table, the, the nexable, the non-existing table. That is not how we can think about existence. That is not how we ought to think about existence. And if Kant is right, that means that the ontological proof doesn't work. Okay, again, this is very influential. I think it um, definitely gets to something deep about what might be wrong with the ontological argument. Um, honesty and fairness demand that I say that, you know, a lot of later philosophers have tried to reformulate ontological arguments that do not fall to Kant's criticism. Uh, whether those are any more successful is, I guess, a matter for debate. Um, I'm not very much, um, I'm not very positive about that myself. If you're interested in that, maybe look up something like Godel's ontological argument, for instance. Uh, it's a lot of logical uh, complexity that you have to cut through and then find out whether you know anything real is going on there or not. At the very least, what Kant does is he makes us realize that the fact that something looks like a good logical argument, like God is a necessarily existing being, Suppose that God does not exist, contradiction, so God exists. The fact that it looks like a valid logical argument is not enough to show that it actually proves the existence of God. Right? We have to ask deeper questions. Questions about you know, the nature of the predicates that is used in it. Uh, questions about what it means for something to be a contradiction and so on and so forth.